America will never be whole as long as the right to life granted by our Creator is denied to the unborn. Well, thank you, brothers and sisters. It is a joy to be back among you uh, in talking with so many of you before the formal program began tonight. You reminded me of so many of my trips to all different parts of this great state of Wisconsin, and uh, it's been too long since I've been here, and we just need to keep doing the things that we've done over these years uh, as we get to know each other better and better and encourage each other in this ongoing fight for life. Uh, it's not just because I'm here, but when I am asked in so many different settings around the country and around the world uh, for examples of groups that are doing what needs to be done, and succeeding in what needs to be done, I very often point to and speak about Wisconsin Right to Life. So Barbara, once again, congratulations to you and your whole team for everything that you've done over these years, some of which we've seen here tonight, but only some of it we've seen. So much more I'm aware of, and even more uh, you are aware of. So thank you and congratulations. Now, much of what we are thinking about tonight does have to do with uh, legislative progress that has been made and legislative progress that is about to be made. So I want to say a special word of thanks to public officials, some of whom are here present, uh, others of whom, of course, are, are united with you every day in the battle and are pushing this cause forward in ways that are, are, are just not easy to do. But you know, I was, with, um, I was with Senator Rand Paul not too long ago and he told a, he told a, a joke about um, folks like him and elected officials on every level of government. And it, it goes back to the Bible, actually. It was a discussion among uh, three professionals, an argument really about whose profession was the oldest. It was a surgeon, an engineer, and a politician. So the surgeon said, my profession is definitely the oldest. The very first pages of the Bible, you read that God took Adam's rib and from it he formed Eve, requires a surgeon, so mine is the oldest. The engineer piped up, he said, wait, 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 just one second. Before there was Adam and Eve, there was chaos, the Bible says. And out of chaos came order. The sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. God made order out of chaos. He needed an engineer. The politician stood up and said, I'm the oldest profession. Who do you think created all the chaos? <laughs> But we are celebrating here tonight, among many things, the fact that we have here in Wisconsin so much of what we need. Of what we need here, of what we need in every state, of what we need in Washington, D.C. And that is public servants who know the difference between serving the public and killing the public. These are the kind of public servants we need, and if they don't, if a public servant doesn't know the difference between serving and killing, well then he or she doesn't belong in public office. It's as simple as that. And we really have to be able, and one of the things we do is help the, the clergy to be able to say exactly that. Oh, when we say that, some of the criticism that we do get, like Vicki was referring to, is, oh, well, you people are partisan, you're promoting one party and one candidate over another, and so on and so forth. I say, listen, if what I say about defending life helps candidate A but hurts candidate B or helps one party and hurts the other, guess whose fault that is? It's theirs for taking the wrong position. Yes. 
You want to be hurt by what I say? Get on the opposite side of life and you'll be hurt plenty, but it's your fault, not mine. Don't blame us who say yes to life because when we convey the message we convey, it will help everyone who stands up and speaks up for what is right and good and just. Our message does not ebb and flow, rise and fall, change and change again with the winds of political platforms. We stand on a platform of truth, justice, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our platform. And it doesn't change. There are many young people here tonight, many students. Your father referred to the, the hope and the joy that you have when you, you can look into the eyes of students like those here tonight and you can see the future. But to those of you who here are students, young pro-lifers, let me say this. You are not simply future leaders in this movement. You are leaders now, here and now and today. And one of the things I always say to youth groups around the country is this. Sometimes you'll hear those of us who have been in the movement for a while say things like, well, we're going to pass the torch to you. We're going to pass on the baton. We're going to, you know, you guys have to finish the job that we started. I take a somewhat different view. I think what we need to say to our young people and what I want to say to you tonight is simply this. Take our hand. Those of us who have been in this movement for decades, take our hand. Join your hand to ours. Join your hearts and minds to ours. Because you know what? Together, we're going to go over the finish line. Together, we're going to go into the promised land. We're going to see an end to this evil of legalized abortion. We're going to see it in our lifetime. And brothers and sisters, it's going to come faster than any of us realize. We don't know exactly how it's going to come. If you get 100 pro-life leaders in a room, as we often do when we have strategy meetings, you get 250 ideas about how abortion is actually going to end. And nobody knows if they're right or if they're wrong. But one thing we do know, it will end. And that's the goal of our movement. It's not simply to reduce abortion. It's not simply to witness against abortion. It's not simply to expose the deceitfulness behind abortion. It is to end abortion. That's our goal. so many of the strategies that work is a very simple principle that I want to leave you with tonight to reflect on and to act on. It's actually a biblical principle. It comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 11. He says this, Have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather expose them. Now think about this for a moment. I often say the abortion industry does our work for us. Because you cannot come up with more persuasive educational material, more persuasive sermon material, more persuasive anything, if you want to convince people that abortion is wrong, than abortion. You know what the last thing is that supporters of abortion want to talk about? Abortion. Yeah. Right? Think about it. They want to talk about freedom, reproductive choice. You know what one of their favorite new terms is? Reproductive justice. They'll talk about, you know, in fact, you know, the pro-choice movement has basically decided that the term pro-choice has run its course. It's not serving them anymore. So you know now what they claim to do? They claim to be pro-life. Yeah, I know, that kind of twists your mind, right? <laughs> they claim to be, because they're saying, no, no, if you, if you support policies that, that permit abortion, you're actually saving lives. Because then people are going to, they're going to have the choice to do what they know they have to do to get on in life. And, you know, later on they'll raise a family and they come up with all kinds of twisted thinking. But they actually are, are, are adopting now more the language of justice and life. Okay, well, all right. They're going to try whatever they can try. The last thing they want to talk about is abortion. 
And look at the, the Democratic Convention prior to the last year's elections. I mean, if, if they decided to have a televised convention of Planned Parenthood and National Abortion Federation, could they have had more of a pro-abortion lineup of speakers than they had? But one thing, not the president, not any of these keynote speakers, none of them would do or dare to say. And that is to quote a medical textbook on how abortions are done, to describe for two minutes or even for 30 seconds to describe what an abortion is. They won't dare do it. They won't do it in the Democratic Convention. Supporters of abortion won't do it in the United States Congress. I'm sure they won't do it here in the state capitol building. They won't do it anywhere. Not on radio, television, internet, no place. They don't want the public to see what this actually is. And that's where we have our greatest strength. Because first of all, as was said in the Civil Rights Movement, no lie can live forever. Hide the truth however which way you want, for however long you want to try to hide it, it's going to come out in the end. And furthermore, the conscience and the heart of the American people is going to accept the word of truth much more readily than the word of falsehood, even if the word of falsehood is trumpeted louder. Now, brothers and sisters, this truth, this principle, that when we expose abortion, we end it, that abortion destroys itself, is another way of thinking about it, is being played out right now in that Philadelphia courtroom. Kermit Gosnell, one of many abortionists, many abortionists, who are doing things that if the majority of Americans who consider themselves pro-choice heard about, they would absolutely be speechless at the horror of what is happening. This man, his, his, his wicked deeds for decades have now begun to come to light because of a number of different circumstances. Again, no lie can live forever. You cannot hide the truth forever. So now, through a series of circumstances which have brought his activities to light, we have had, over the last almost two months, testimony after testimony by 54 witnesses in a Philadelphia courtroom about his practices. Now, I was at much of the trial myself. I sat in the front row of the courtroom. Kermit Gosnell was closer to me than, than, than you are to me right now. I sat right behind him. He smiled during most of the proceedings. I mean, can you imagine? You're being accused of murder of babies and, and, and of women, and he sits there with a, with, a, with, a, with a smile on his face. The reason for that is the disconnect psychologically, spiritually, that abortionists have to undergo for their own protection. Remember Bernard Nathanson, in his book, The Hand of God, he talks about how he aborted his own child. His own child. And he says, I swear to you, I felt nothing. But you say, you must have had some ounce of sorrow. No, he says. All I had was the sense, the professional sense, of having done a thorough job. What kind of what kind of, of switches do you have to shut off in your mind and heart and conscience and soul to get to that point? Well, this is what they do, otherwise they would go crazy. And in fact, this is why some of them do go crazy. In a few weeks, by the way, this is this is this is uh, a uh, not something you'll see written about in pro-life newsletters or, or anything like that. I will be leading a retreat for a group of former abortion clinic workers. They're coming out all over the place. They're leaving the industry. And uh, when they come out of the industry, as we want them to do, they need a place to go. And they're on a journey, and they need help. 
They need profound healing. As you know, those who have had abortions need profound healing. And that's why we at Priests for Life are so constantly, daily, so proud, so overjoyed to be um, overseeing and, and, and moderating the work of Rachel's Vineyard. So many of you here involved in that ministry. We have the Rachel's Vineyard banner up here tonight. Largest ministry in the world for healing after abortion. Those of us who work in Rachel's Vineyard understand the profound journey that those who have had abortions go through as they reach that place of peace and healing that God wants us all to be. How much more profound and complex is the journey of someone who can sit there and say, I took with my own hands, I took a thousand lives. I took 10,000 lives. Bernard Nathanson was responsible for 75,000 abortions. It, it, it's, I had the pleasure of receiving Norma McCorvey into the Catholic Church back in 1998, the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade. To this day, to, to this day, she is crushed under the weight. Now, she knows she is redeemed in Christ. In fact, the first time I met her, the first time I met her back then, mid-90s, I said, so you're the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade? She said, no, I was the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade. Now I am a new creation in Christ. <laughs> and she knows that and she believes that, but brothers and sisters, that doesn't take away the crushing burden of the wound of just thinking even for 10 seconds, it was I who was the spark for a decision that has claimed over 50 million lives in America. It's unthinkable. So the weight that these people bear is profound. But the mercy of Christ is greater. The love that we have for these people is greater and we can show it to them and we need to show it to them and we are doing that. So in a few weeks we will bring these people together and they will they will go through this uh, this journey of, of healing. It's part of the journey. The journey is lifelong. But brothers and sisters, Kermit Gosnell, he needs this journey of healing too. And if you follow this trial, and the verdict is now being deliberated by the jury, we don't know. It's been a week already they've been deliberating. We don't know how much longer it will take. But they seem to be doing a very thorough job. The latest is that they want to rehear the testimony of one of the witnesses in regard to one of the babies uh, that was killed. And so tomorrow morning, this woman's testimony of 270 pages is going to be reread to them line by line uh, in the courtroom. They're really doing a thorough job. Because what they have to weigh are four charges of first degree murder because, the charge says, this man delivered these babies. They were alive after birth. They were outside the body of this mother, so we're no longer talking about legal abortion. We're talking under the law about murder of a living child and four different counts for different cases. Then a woman who came to him for an abortion who was overdosed with medication and uh, died, case of third degree murder. And part of that third degree murder uh, charge, the, 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 the argument that it was the conditions under which this clinic operated that led to her death. What do we mean by the conditions? Untrained staff. He had a 15-year-old doing ultrasounds, giving medications, 15-year-old, whom he gave a, a medical textbook to read for 20 minutes, and then she was, uh, she was practicing medicine. I, I mean, things that, it's like, are we joking here? Are we making this up? In the courtroom were the, some of, was some of the equipment that was taken from his abortion mill when it was raided back in 2010. And some of the equipment was there. Exposed, corroded wires on the electrical equipment which caused it to malfunction. An ultrasound machine so old that the ultrasound technicians who were there didn't know how to work it. Reused plastic cannulas that are, that are used for the suction abortion. I saw them right up in front of me. 
yellow, discolored, caked with blood, used multiple times over and over, expired medications, and on and on it goes. Horrifying to hear this testimony in court, but you know what the saddest thing about it was for me and for the several other pro-life leaders who were in that courtroom? None of it was anything that we had not heard before. That's, this is the most tragic part. I mean, it would be one thing if these things came to light and we were able to say, oh, well, this is, we've never heard anything like this before. This is an anomaly. This, this, this guy is way off the charts. He's not way off the charts. He is at the center of the charts. Kermit Gosnell, the things he did, the way he did them, and the condition of that facility, brothers and sisters, this is the time we have to awaken our brothers and sisters across this country to understand something. Kermit Gosnell is not the exception. He's the norm. It is the entire abortion industry that's on trial here. Aside from above and beyond whatever the verdict is going to be in regard to this particular man, the question of this trial is much bigger. When are we going to face what's going on in the abortion industry in this country? Have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather expose them. You know, I've come to see that some of the greatest moments of progress for the pro-life movement happen without the intelligent, experienced, labored planning and strategizing that those of us in pro-life leadership do every day. We try to see the way forward. We try to plan it. We try to marshal our forces, to bring people together, to figure out the way. Barbara does this all the time on the state level, so many of you do it with her. We try to figure out the way. And then some of the greatest progress happens when something just falls out of the sky. It's a bolt of lightning, totally unplanned, totally unexpected, and yet it jolts our movement into a new stage of progress. That's what this trial is. This is a moment when the American people, I'm talking now about pro-choice Americans. They're being forced to say something. Not necessarily, oh, now I'm against all abortion. No, no, no. I'm talking about people who now are forced to say, you know what? There's a limit. <clears throat> this has this, this got to stop somewhere. It's got to stop somewhere. Now, you know what the absurd thing was in the courtroom? Many absurd things. But the defense attorney with whom I've spoken and, and communicated, Jack McMahon, Gosnell's defense attorney was making the argument in his closing arguments just a week ago that Dr. Gosnell should not be accused of murder of these babies. Why? Because he took digoxin, which is a medication that abortionists are quite familiar with. They, 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 they stick a needle into the woman's abdomen, right into the womb and into the heart of the baby, and the digoxin stops the baby's heart, kills the baby in the womb, so when the baby comes out, the baby's already dead. If the baby's already dead, then legally it's not murder. So this man is not guilty. This was the argument. This was one of the key arguments made in his defense. Now, as it turns out, the witnesses testified, number one, yes, the babies were alive after they were born because we, we heard them cry, we saw them move, we saw them breathe, we saw the heartbeat, they were alive. But the witnesses also testified to something else. Yes, Dr. Gosnell tried to use the digoxin, but didn't work, because he didn't do it the right way, because you have to aim it just right. And so when he saw it wasn't working, he stopped using it altogether. And in fact, in 2010, when they raided that facility, when they took all the medications that were there, many of which, as I said, were expired, guess what they did not find? They didn't find any digoxin. Oh, that's a pretty convincing piece of testimony if I were a member of the jury. So, if he was using digoxin, where was it? Where was it? He wasn't expecting the raid. He didn't know they were coming. Where was it? Brothers and sisters, but here's the absurdity. Nobody in that courtroom 
was denying that this man killed babies. Nobody was denying that those were babies. The word baby was used in the arguments, not fetus. Every once in a while I heard the word fetus, but the word baby was being used over and over again, not just by the prosecution, by the defense. Nobody in that courtroom denied that babies were being killed. Nobody denied that Gosnell was the one killing them. Nobody denied that they were alive and then they were dead, that the heart was beating and then it stopped. Nobody denied this. Nobody was trying to make this silly argument that they're just tissue. Nobody used the term potential human life. Nobody used the silly slogans of the pro-choice advocates from over the decades. Nobody. Here was the argument. Here was the argument. What method was used to kill them? And where were they when they died? That was the argument. What method was used and where were they? The equivalent of what went on in that courtroom would be that if somebody we know killed his wife, imagine sitting in a courtroom with tragic situations, a man you know killed his wife. It would be like sitting in the courtroom and listening to the following argument. This man should be declared not guilty because he killed his wife inside their house, not out on the street. Or, this man should be declared not guilty because he didn't use a gun, he used a knife. Literally, that is the state of the arguments going on in this trial. Brothers and sisters, independent of whatever this verdict will be, it might come out tomorrow, it might be a few more days. Independent of that, abortion is on trial here. It is, even though Rightly so, the prosecution and the defense both said, and the judge all said, listen, this is not a trial about the legality of abortion. That's right, because this jury has a very specific task to do, and I think they're doing it very well. But in reality, abortion is not a trial. Not only from the point of view of what is this, what's happening to these babies, but also from the point of view of the conditions that have been revealed in, from Gosnell's mill, and that I'm telling you tonight, are taking place in hundreds of other bills right this very moment. Now, you may know, and some of you mentioned it to me earlier, that I've made a request in this case. I spoke to a number of people, including the judge. I spoke to uh, the, uh, I wrote to the medical examiner in Philadelphia, in whose possession right now are the bodies, sometimes just body parts, of some 45 babies who were found in, in Gosnell's mill when it was raided. Some of them in the freezer. Some of them in milk jugs, in uh, ju orange juice containers, in cat litter containers. Bodies all over the place. They were collected, they were brought to the medical examiner. Some of them are the bodies of these babies who are associated with the murder charges. I made a request to the medical examiner that at the appropriate time, once this trial is completely finished, the priest for life be allowed to receive those bodies because we are going to have a funeral for them. Burial service, nationwide. We are not just going to let these babies remain in the abstract. We're not just going to let them be, be viewed as the medical waste that was discovered in Gosdell's clinic. We're not just going to let people be horrified about how they were killed. We're going to let people honor these children and make up for the dishonor they suffered through abortion. We're going to give them a massive funeral public. We don't want to bury them quietly off to the side. No, no, no. That's not what we need right now. We need something in the bright light of day for people all over the place to come forward and to honor these children. You know what we're going to do? Even as we wait to receive the bodies of these babies, I'm going to do something tomorrow. If you look at the court testimony you're going to, and look at the grand jury report, you see the babies that the witnesses testified that he cut their, their necks, called baby boy A, baby boy B, baby C, baby D, baby, baby E, F, G. Tomorrow, I'm going to hold a prayer service in New York City 
and we are going to bestow names on these babies. Because these babies are people. These babies are our brothers and sisters. Now some people might say, well, who are you to give them a name? Well, their mothers and fathers for, 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 have forsaken them. They threw them away. They had them killed. Gosnell didn't care. The Lord has given us responsibility for one another. And just because somebody's father and mother forsake them, that does not give us permission to forsake them. They are our brothers and sisters. We're going to do something else. Uh, you'll see this on Facebook. By the way, those of you who are on Facebook, Pro-Life Page. That's our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Facebook.com, Pro-Life Page. We will put the information tomorrow. We're going to put a video up there of this naming ceremony. We're going to put the names of the babies, not just the, the four, but all 45 of them. And then in September, again, we don't know when we'll get the Gosnell babies, but in September, we're going to have a National Day of Remembrance. There are about 28 places across this nation some of them here in Wisconsin, where aborted babies have been buried. Some of you may have been involved in the burials that took place over the years. These are babies who were discovered in the trash bins outside the abortion clinics, or who in some cases were presented to the pro-life movement through pathologists who received the bodies from the clinics. Various different ways we came to possess these bodies. But they've been buried in about 28 different grave sites. Some of these grave sites have hundreds and some even have thousands of bodies buried in the same grave. These are mass graves. There was one incident in the mid 80s in California where a big garbage container was discovered that had inside of it 16,500 aborted babies. And the pro-aborts tried to stop their burial for three years. A legal battle ensued because they said, oh, you bury them, you're acknowledging their humanity. You bet we are. They tried to stop it. They did not succeed. Those babies were buried. Cardinal Bernadette had buried a, a 2,000 babies back in, I think it was 25 years ago, 1988, in Chicago. And on and on the stories go. We want to bring attention. We want to remind people of these stories. And we want to make sure they never forget that in their midst are buried these, our brothers and sisters. Have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness. Rather, expose them. This is how we win. Yes, we have a positive message. Of course we have a positive message. Life is beautiful. Life is wonderful. We are fulfilled when we give ourselves away to our children. And we give examples of that. We give testimonies of that. But to move a movement and to eradicate a social injustice, you've got to upset people. You, 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 you've got to shock the consciences into a state of alertness because brothers and sisters, they were asleep. It's not enough to show the beauty of life. You have to show the violence of what takes life. And whether, we, whether we're doing it or not, you know what, the truth is coming out. And as it does come out, we accelerate the process. We shine a brighter light on it. And at the same time, through Rachel's Vineyard, through Silent No More, through the pregnancy resources that we give and the forgiveness we offer afterwards, we are surrounding that dark, hideous evil with the arms of compassion, love, forgiveness, and redemption. So that as in, you'll see my books out there on the table, please stop and take the things there. i got things there for your parishes. I don't have time to go into it, but we've got uh, one thing out there that you can bring to your pastor as a bulletin insert. You can save someone's life today. Read through it. You'll see what I mean. The prayer cards that are on the table. Priest for Life will provide those cards to your parish. Whatever quantity you need, free of charge. We want people praying every day for the end of abortion. But you'll see Janet's book out there called, and I know this is a, this is a sensitive and maybe even somewhat traumatic word in Wisconsin. Recall. <laughs> Janet's book is called Recall Abortion. Recall abortion, double meaning, remember it, because those who've had it testify and they remember the details. But recall, take a bad product off the market. The evidence we have is clear. The voices of testimony are loud and persistent. Recall, 
this damaging, destructive product and service that is no service at all, but simply a disaster. Brothers and sisters, through all these resources, let's keep doing what we are doing. Because as Fulton Sheen said, the world is tearing up the photographs of what it means to be human. But God's people are keeping the negatives. And when the world grows tired of its love affair with death, it will go in search of those who remember. And it will find you. It will find that understanding. It will hear that forgotten song of the beauty of human life. It will hear it being sung by Wisconsin Right to Life. It will hear it being sung by the various ministries and organizations that all of you represent. It will hear it being sung by your families, your parishes, you personally. It will hear it being sung by your radio programs. It will hear it being sung by the great symphony that all of us here represent. And so brothers and sisters, let us keep singing it in harmony. Let us come together in greater unity and strength than ever. Let us march forward to see the end of abortion. God bless you.